Greetings, Nick with Sweetwater here, and today we're going to be taking a look at five practice tips for guitarists of all ages who are literally just starting out on this intrepid and fun journey. Yup, as its five practice tips for beginner guitarist title hopefully makes crystal clear, this video is for beginners. Now, that's not to say someone who's been playing for a little while might not get something out of it, but as just stated, this is a short video specifically made for, wait for it, yup, beginners. This mission statement slash disclaimer clearly stated, let's get into it. Incidentally, the end game of this video, by the way, is this. In addition to the five tips, you're also gonna learn the simple three chord ditty I played this video with, using these three chords here. A minor, C, and E minor. And as an added bonus, there's a link to the backing track for it below so you can play along at home once you've learned it. Sound like a plan? Good, let's begin. Now, I'm gonna assume that in addition to having a guitar, you also know your guitar's string names and also how to read a chord window. One of these bad boys shown on the screen right here. Now, if you can't do this yet, don't fret though, there's a link to a quick simple lesson in the text below. And as an added bonus, this link will also introduce you to the unforgettably silly phrase, Eddie ate dynamite, goodbye Eddie. This will ensure you always remember your strings names in terms of their tuning, namely E, A, D, G, B, E, going from the thick E to the high E, both called Eddie. I'm also gonna assume you're somewhat familiar with four of the first open chord shapes we all invariably learn. Often fondly referred to as cowboy chords, these four shapes I'm talking about are as follows. A minor. C. E minor. And last, but certainly not least, D. Once again, if these are completely new to you, don't worry, just click the link below and all will be revealed. So if you don't know these and anything else I've just talked about, what are you waiting for? Go learn what you don't already know yet, and I'll be right here waiting for you as soon as you've done that deed. And this is tip number one, making every note count. Yes, my friend, for each and every chord we play, we obviously wanna make every note in it count. By that I mean we wanna hear each and every darn note. To do this, we need to make sure that we're not only fretting the notes in the chord correctly, but also not inadvertently muting any other strings while we do so. To explain this, let's look at our E minor chord, shall we? As you can see from the chord window on the screen, this chord involves all six strings via two fretted notes and four open string notes. Our two fretted notes are the second frets on the A and D strings using our first and second fingers respectively. Incidentally, this chord can also be fingered using your second and third fingers like this. But for the purpose of this lesson, we're gonna use fingers one and two. I'll explain exactly why very shortly. Now, to fret these notes correctly, we need to use our fingertips and also get as close to the fret as we possibly can without going over the fret. We also need to curve our two fretting fingers like bird claws. We don't want them collapsed like this. Uh-uh. We want them like this. This is good, this bad. We also wanna make jolly sure that our second finger isn't accidentally touching and thus muting the G string like this. Once again, we don't want that, we want this. We need to hear that all important open G string. So our second finger needs to create a bridge so our G string can ring freely just like a bird. And as you can see, all it takes is a minor rotation of my hand to fix this misnomer. So the, here it is with it muted. Here it is, all good. So once we've fingered the chord, we now need to pick each and every note within it to make sure all is well, just like this. Perfect. If we don't do this when we're learning the chord shape right off the bat, we might end up missing a muted note or three. I mean, this sounds fine, right? But it's not, because if I break it down, that G string is muted once again. This is what the chord should sound like, not this. 
Once again, notice the minor adjustment it takes to fix it. From this, I'm just doing a slow rotation of my hand towards me. Pretty good, right? It's important that you do this with each and every chord when you're learning them at first. So please apply due diligence and check every note when you're learning a chord. After all, we want to create good habits, not bad ones that involve chords that have missing notes. Your homework? To do the same exact thing with the other three chords, namely A minor, C and D. Got it? Finger them, then check every note within them, including those all important open strings that are part of the chord. For example, like the open high E string notes in the chords C and A minor. This sounds okay, right? But guess what? The C I'm playing inadvertently has that high E muted, but it's being muted by the underside of my first finger. Darn it, that's close, but no carrot. Once again, a minor adjustment, rotating it towards me. That fixes it, the necessary bridge is created and a great sounding full chord happens. This one here. So this is good. This is not so good. Okay, but that's better. So remember, always apply due diligence when learning a chord at first. Get all those notes in there. Two other quick things. Firstly, your fretboard hand nails need to be nice and short. Sorry, folks. Yep, you need to use one of these because you literally need to be pressing the flesh when fretting notes. Secondly, and this is something I really have to point out, playing the guitar is not easy, by the way, especially at the start when you're first beginning. There's no shortcut, I'm afraid. There's no app for this. Learn to play the guitar in a day is up there with the check is in the mail and five second abs as pure and utter nonsense. Lies, my friend, lies. Don't believe what you see on the internets. To become a good guitar player, you've just got to put in the time and effort. There's no shortcut, like I've just said. And please be patient. Don't get frustrated. Remember, you're asking your hands and fingers to do things they've never done before, ever. So please give them a chance and stick with it. For example, how long will you give a newborn baby to learn how to walk and crawl? A week? 10 days? A month? Three months? No, sir. You give them as long as it takes and help them all you can along the way. I rest my case. So give your fingers the same chance. They can and will succeed, I promise. <laughs> And so we come to tip number two, rule of thumb, X marks a spot. If we take a look at the chord windows of both A minor and C, we will see an X in parentheses or brackets is over the low E string. What does this mean? What it means is this, try not to hit that string, but if you do so, it's okay, it's not the end of the world. The reason it's okay in both of these chords is because they each happen to contain the note E within themselves. That said, we'd rather not an E be the lowest note. Here's A minor with the low E string ringing. And here it is without. They both sound okay, but in my humble opinion, the second one, the one without the low E, sounds way, way better. And the same is true of the C chord. Here is C with the low E string ringing. Ah, it's okay, but here it is without much, much clearer. To help us avoid hitting this okay note, we can do the following thanks to our handy dandy fretboard hand thumb. This one right here, we can bring it over the top of the neck and rest it lightly against the guilty string we'd rather not hit. As you can see, I'm actually hitting the note there, the low E string, but it's so muted you can't hear it over the chord. Perfect. A cheat that works. And talking of X's, actually that's another video on another topic, but anyway, going back to X's over notes, let's take a quick look at the chord window for D, shall we? This time, as you can see, the X over the low E string is not in brackets, but the one over the open A string is. So, pray tell, what does the X with no brackets tell us? It tells us this. If we hit that string when strumming the D chord, it'll, uh, Suck! Don't believe me? Check this out. Here's the D chord with the low E string played in it. Uh, no, here it is without. 
now we're talking, actually, if we play it with the open A string in as well, that's okay. In fact, in my humble opinion, it sounds pretty darn good, which is probably why a lot of bands, including ACDC, often hit the open A string when hitting an open D or D5 power chord, because it sounds good. So that's what X in parentheses and out of parentheses means, and that's why the rule of thumb is a great one, because when I'm playing D, I fit all six strings, you hear the open A, which sounds great, but not the open E because I've muted it. Perfect. And that's the only reason, by the way, I included the D chord in this lesson because we're not using it in the chord progression we're about to learn. And here's tip number three, pivot points. What I'm talking about here is looking for any and all commonality in the chord shapes you're changing between. What exactly do I mean by this? Let me explain via the C and A minor chord shapes. These two right here, C and A minor. As you can hopefully see via the wonderful chord diagram illustrations on the screen, your first and second fingers are in the same place for both chords. Second finger there, first finger there. Here's A minor. And hey presto, once again. Second finger at second fret on D string, first finger at first fret on B. Nice, that means when I go between the two chords, only one finger is moving. My third finger, and it's going from the third fret on the A string for the C to the second fret on the G string for the A. So we go. Nice. As changing between these two chords, namely C and A minor is pretty common, it's well worth your while practicing this move back and forth just like this. Perfect. The same is also true of C and E minor. Changes between these two are pretty common. And that's why I recommended we finger the E minor using our first and second fingers earlier in the video. Makes sense? Like I said, two and three are good, but for this particular lesson, we're gonna stick with fingers one and two. The reason we're doing this is very simple. It means that when we change from C to E minor or vice versa, our second finger doesn't have to move when you switch between the two shapes. Let's start with C, shall we? As you can see, my second finger is at the second fret on the D string. Then we go to E minor. See what I mean? I'm literally pivoting around my middle finger because it stays where it is, right here at the second fret on the D string. So yep, it's a pivot point. And the same exact logic applies when we change between E minor and A minor two. Once again, we can pivot around our middle finger because it stays where it is. So. As the chord sequence we have to be learning in a minute goes, A minor, C, E minor, and repeats, having a pivot finger like this that stays where it is for all three chords is pretty darned useful. See what I mean? Pretty cool stuff, huh? So yeah, looking out for a finger or two that doesn't have to move when you change between chords is something definitely worth doing. So I'd suggest you practice the changes we've just gone over and take your time, by the way. Remember, playing guitar isn't a competition and it's not Amazon Prime either. You don't just start playing and you're doing it two days later perfectly. So remember, it's slow shipping. Also, don't get frustrated because it will take a while. As already stated, you're asking your hands and fingers to do things they've never done before. So be patient. Next up, tip number four, the good old knee slap. As cool as finding pivot points or fingers that don't have to move when changing chords is, sadly, they don't always exist, my friend. And ultimately, we want to be able to quickly and effortlessly finger any chord shape we know regardless of what chord is played before it. And this is where the knee slap trick comes into play. This is a very simple but effective way of programming a chord shape into your muscle memory. All you do here is this, and we'll do it with our old pal, the A minor shape. First, you finger the chord shape and make sure every note is ringing correctly like this. Then having made it, we do this. 
Yes, I take my fretboard hand off the fretboard and slap it onto my knee, making sure my palm is completely flat. That makes sure I'm not holding my fingers where they were. So I go from here to slap flat. Then I go back and do the chord again. Do it again. And keep doing it. Making sure I'm not inadvertently muting or misfretting any of the notes. I suggest you do this over and over again and don't cheat. Make sure your palm is totally flat when you slap your knee. And after a while, like I've just said, muscle memory will slowly but surely kick in. And invariably, you'll start finding your fretboard hand making the shape as it leaves the flat knee slap like this. Can you see what's happening there? If I do it slowly, slap flat, my hand's making the position kind of sort of before I get to the fretboard so I'm ready to go. This will take a while, but the end result will be well worth it. So do it on every darn chord shape you know, and on the new ones as well, the ones you don't know yet. Another trick is this, try and do the knee slap between different chords too, like say A minor to C to E minor, just like this. Got it? Actually, to be diligent, what I should have done is this. I should have made sure each note in each string was correct. So let's start again. Here's A minor. Slap. C. Good. Slap. E minor. Perfect. That will help, I promise. And this brings us to tip number five, the last one in this video. I've got countless more, but we wanted to keep it at five. And this one, talking of counting, is entitled Count Me In. Now, at the end of the day, music is all about timing. It's not just about being able to change chords quickly and accurately. It's about making those all important changes at the correct time. And that's where counting comes in. Yup. Being able to count to four is really important in all forms of guitar playing and music in general. From rock, pop, country, blues, metal, and folk, the one, two, three, four count is pretty darned important. That's why you hear a lot of bands start a song with a count of one, two, three, four of some sort when they're playing live. It might be the drummer hitting the cymbals, tss, 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 or clicking the sticks, click, 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 or the guitar player doing this, or simply someone going, one, two, three, four. Why? Because it tells you the tempo of the song, namely how fast or slow it's gonna be played. Makes sense? For example, a ballad might be really slow, like this, one, two, three, four. Whereas a punk metal or rock and roll song might be a little bit faster, maybe just a hair, like one, two, three, four. <laughs> Get my drift, bad playing, but you get the point. Slow, medium pace, fast. It's all about the count. So to get into this idea, we're gonna be counting and strumming in unison. Here's what I mean using the E minor as my chord of choice. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Make sense? As you could hopefully see and hear, on each and every count, I'm picking all six strings with a single deft downstroke. One, two, three, four. And as you can also hopefully see, while I'm doing this, my forearm is going up and down like this. And as you can also hopefully see, I'm only hitting the strings on the way down. I'm not hitting them again on the way back up. That's a topic for another lesson. So I'm doing this. <laughs> Now, what a lot of players do to keep time is tap their foot like this. I do this all the time and hopefully you can hear it. So my foot is hitting the ground on each beat. One, two, three, four. Got it? For this very reason, our one, two, three, four counts are often referred to as the downbeats. Make sense? So what we're doing with our strumming right now is hitting each and every beat with a down strum. Synchronicity, not just a good police album. I like it. Before we go any further, let's quickly make sure of two things. First off, 
Let's make sure you're holding your pick correctly. You grip it between the thumb and first finger of your picking hand, just like this. And when you hold your arm parallel to the floor like this, the tip of the pick is pointing towards the floor. It's not pointing away from you. It's pointing down to the floor like this. Also, please make sure you don't have too much of your pick sticking out. You want it to be kind of like this, not like this. The reason you don't want too much sticking out is you want to have control over it. And if you've got too much sticking out, it's going to be floppy and it might just fall out of your hands. Just like that. If I liken it to... Actually, does anyone have a pen in here? Perfect. Look at this magic. So if I get my pen out, if I write like this, with a lot of the pen sticking out, it'll be even more messier than usual. But when I close up to the tip like this, your writing will be much, much neater, even mine. Why? Because you've got much better control. And that, my friend, is why you don't have too much of your pick's tip sticking out. Got it? Good. The other thing is this. Even though we're effectively strumming from our elbow joint, we don't want to lock our wrist up. We're not playing punk rock right now, as cool as that can be. Instead, we want our wrist joint to be nice and relaxed, like this. I liken it to stroking a dog or a cat, maybe. Or perhaps painting a wall. Or even waving goodbye. Get my drift? Don't lock your wrist when doing the strumming. Keep it nice and loosey-goosey. Anyway, enough of my darned yammering. Now it's time to do our A minor to C to E minor chord change in time while counting or tapping our foot. Are you ready? Because this is what we're going to do. Now, to work up to that, we're going to start by just hitting each chord once per change. And using music speak, we're going to call each four count a bar. That just means there's four evenly timed beats within a bar. Got it? So one bar is this. One, two, three, four. Got it? Good. Now we know this. The timing of our A minor, C, E minor chord progression is this. One bar of A minor, followed by one bar of C, then two, not one, but two bars of E minor, making four in total. See? Four is a very important number. So if I just hit these chords on the first beat of their respective bars, I get this. One, two, three, four. 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 Got it? Having done this, I then just go back to the start and repeat the same thing over again. So that's exactly what you're going to do now. You're going to count or tap your foot and just play each chord on the first beat of each four. That way it'll go A minor, C, E minor, E minor, and then repeat just like this. One, two, three, four. 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 Now, by hitting each chord on the one count gives you counts two, three, and four to get ready for your next chord. Make sense? So I'm effectively you're doing this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So work on that until you've got it down and can repeat it consistently without any mistakes. Remember, timing is important. The one is important. Don't believe me? Just ask Bootsy Collins. One. Anyway, once you've mastered this, we're now going to hit each chord on beats one and two of each bar, just like this. I'm going to count myself in and then do the deed. One, two, three, four. 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 Four. Obviously, doing this reduces your chord change window by a beat. So now we've just got three and four to make the change. So it's one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Got it? Once you've mastered this, guess what? Yep, this time you're going to hit each chord on beats one, two, and three of each bar, 
giving you only one beat number four to change to the next chord, namely this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. And that is exactly how I played the intro along to the backing track at the start. So download it and have at it. Now, if you're up for a challenge, and I know you are, try playing the sequence while hitting each and every chord on each and every downbeat like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And then when you've got it, try and do it along with the backing track. Now, this will be tough at first because you're just starting out. But like I said, stick with it because you'll get it. Where there's a will, there's a way. That's how the saying goes. But there's one proviso. You've got to put the work in. And talking of work, let's get to my summary, shall we? Which is called Practice Makes Perfect. Your relationship with your new best friend, your guitar, is one of the most honest ones you will ever have in your life. I say that because your buddy the guitar will give you exactly what you give it. So if you practice consistently and diligently, it will reward you handsomely over time. Conversely, if you give it nothing by not practicing, you just leave it in the corner in its case, it will give you nothing in return. You get nothing, sir. Nada, zero. There's no malice involved. You just get what you give. So if you give nothing, you get nothing. So let's say you decide you can only practice two hours a week. I say only because you might think that sounds a lot, but realistically it's not. Let's think about it. That's just a couple of episodes of Stranger Things or Breaking Bad. And be honest, you probably spend much longer every day mindlessly scrolling through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. That said, if you decide that two hours a week is your maximum, don't just do two hours on Sunday and then not touch your guitar for the next six days. That won't work, my friend. You've got to be consistent or regimented to make sure your precious practice time really pays off. To this end, 20 minutes a day, six days a week would be much more beneficial. So stick with it. And like I said, don't get frustrated. It ain't easy, especially at first. But if you stick with it and apply the three sacred P's, namely practice, patience, and persistence, or if you like, perseverance, it will pay off in spades, I promise. This is your best buddy. And when you give it something, it will return it. And there you have it, my first five tips. If this lesson has proved useful and you'd like more of the same, please let me know in the comments below. And by the way, as you've probably noticed, I'm a lefty. Don't worry about it. It's just like looking in a mirror. And also it's worth getting used to watching what lefties do because people like Tony Omi, Kurt Cobain, Paul McCartney, Jimi Hendrix, all lefties. So learn how to read what a lefty's doing and it's all good. Anyway, I'm going to play it by strumming every darn downbeat of our A minus C, E minus sequence along with the backing track you can download. I'm out. See ya. Thank you so very much for watching. Please don't forget to comment, nicely please, like and subscribe. Click here for more videos like this or visit sweetwater.com for all your music instrument and pro audio needs. Once again, thanks a lot for watching. Goodbye.